welcome to the 29th Annual Reynolds Historical Lecture and to the Reynolds Historical Library and Museum of the Health Sciences. My name is Hughes Evans and I'm honored to serve as the chair of the Reynolds Steering Committee. Each year, the annual Reynolds Historical Lecture brings in a distinguished lecturer to teach our students, faculty, and alumni about a major topic. This lectureship is supported through the generosity of the Provost's Office, the Dean of the School of Medicine, the Caduceus Club, and the President's Office. This is a special year for the Reynolds Library, even a special week, because on February 2nd, 1958, 50 years ago, the library was dedicated. You can read more about Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, whose magnificent collection of rare and valuable medical texts form the core of our historical collection on the back of your program. And after the lecture, you can also uh, come and visit in the, during the reception and see some of uh, our library and our uh, museum. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Flannery, the Associate Director of the UAB Historical Collections, who will tell you a little more about the history and mission of our collections. Thank you, Dr. Evans. It's a pleasure for uh, me to welcome you all here on this really benchmark occasion uh, of the 50th anniversary. Uh, this really fulfills our the, the, the core mission of historical collections here, and that is remembering our past. In order to do that, we thought an appropriate special edition would be to do a video montage of memories of individuals who have a long tradition with the Reynolds Historical Library. So I just simply ask for all of you to sit back and reminisce with us over the next oh, 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you. Born in Skipperville, a little tiny little place, and then the family later moved to Ozark in southeast Alabama. And they bought a large home, and my grandfather was well to do, I guess you would, could say, because they had nine children, and every one of them finished college. He grew up in a family that was educated, and therefore it was normal for him to like books and love books. And he collected them always. And as I say, they were in, in Detroit. They were in his home. And he didn't have any grants of, of anything for books. He bought all of them and enjoyed them and shared them. One of the librarians from, uh, from uh, the library that we had here which was located in the old Hillman building, uh, went and visited with uh, Dr. Reynolds, I believe, in Chicago, and, and uh, indicated that when and if he ever thought about uh, placing his collection somewhere, he ought to think about the University, uh, the Medical College of Alabama. And he returned it home, and I think it's been a great stimulus to uh, faculty and students, and it's brought a lot of attention to uh, this medical center and to the university for people that have come here to, to look at uh, what we have here and to do their research. Almost all of the masters medicine masters are represented in this library. They're working. So we have almost all of them, Vesalius, Harvey, and so many others. Uh, they're here. Uh, for the serious student, this is an opportunity I say to examine the minds of the masters, and, and I think that's one of the strongest justifications we can have for keeping them. Uh, for Dr. Reynolds to be able to see the value of these books and, and of his colleagues to help him to acquire them uh, was a, is a marvelous human interest story. And his willingness to don't let them back to his home state and uh, his home universities where he did his undergraduate work, we are the benefactors of 
of all those hours that he spent locating them, acquiring them, and storing them. The dedication of the library and on February 2nd, 1958 was quite a milestone in the history of, of this institution. Uh, at that time, a number of individuals, uh, guests from outside of the, uh, Birmingham and local uh, people, participated in this dedication. Dr. Tinsley Harrison was our uh, chairman of the Department of Medicine here, the first one uh, when the school moved to Birmingham in 1945. And I'd like to, to, uh, to read his uh, uh, statement at that time. And each time one of you reaps from the great minds of the past the desire for finer achievement in your profession and nobler development of your own character, the Reynolds Library will have been rededicated. I think this uh, summarizes rather um, briefly what the whole library means to the university. I do remember the building, and um, it was a one-story building about the size of a two-car garage, and um, it was uh, it was I think made of yellow brick. Um, it didn't fit in at any way, at any rate. Um, and I went in there several times. You'd, sometimes it was locked, and you had to pursue to find an individual let you in. But the collection was excellent. It was really, I think, the original collection and not much uh, had been added at that time. I remember the building. Oh, it was so exciting to have that building because the library at that time was located in the old Hillman building on the second floor and uh, it wasn't a very exciting place. And this was a wonderful, exciting place to go and look at things and read books and, uh, uh, about, and learn more about the history of medicine. As I remember it, it was uh, uh, made out of Oh, I guess a cream or yellow colored brick, uh, which was, it stood out <laughs> because of that uh, on it, and uh, it was it was a place apart, if you would, when it came to all the other red brick buildings uh, with that yellow brick that it had, and you went into it, and it was such a, a quiet atmosphere and a, a feeling of uh, being home. I, I remember the library being built to house the collection and to enable Dr. Reynolds to come down and spend time with his collection. And so the building was built as a little apartment with his books uh, properly uh, humidified and shelved and so forth. But the idea was that he could come down and live among his books. and. Unfortunately, he didn't really get to do that. But the, the good thing was that the other thing he wanted that library to do was stimulate dialogue among faculty and, and students and, and staff and to give the, the medical students a sense of uh, where medicine had come from. And in that regard, it fulfilled its purpose very well. There were a lot of lectures, a lot of little seminars, just a, a variety of activities that took place in that little building. I think my favorite memory um, is actually using the library to teach students. Um, I've held many courses here in the library and students, for the most part, have uh, just been amazed at what's here and at the environment of kind of exploring and learning that they're just invited to um, learn more about what's in our collection and the books that are here. So I think that my favorite memory is actually a conglomeration of memories of teaching students in the setting, both in the Ireland room but also in here in, uh, in the actual collection. I think my very favorite memory is thinking back to the year 2000, 50th anniversary historical exhibit for the School of Nursing. 
that snowballed, of course, into being a historical lecture by Anita Smith and then her book signing. And I felt like this was my home away from home. There are just many memories of, of the library. And of course, uh, starting the Reynolds Historical Lecture was a big day, and I'm pleased to say that uh, it uh, now has almost been, in, we've had a lecture almost 30 years uh, each year, and we've had outstanding speakers that have been willing to come to the at, to Reynolds Library. Um, that I appreciate very much. We had treasures from uh, from the medical world. I mean, you know, you look at Vesalius, and and there are all those wonderful drawings, and and you and you see Harvey's actual book where he talked about the circulation of the blood. That was so cool. And it was cool to me as a layman, but it was very meaningful to scholars around the world that they could come and, and use that collection and interact uh, with the originals of, of uh, the literature. It's important to understand the past history of medicine to better understand medicine today and the future. Now, um, most medical students don't read about history and they don't read about the past and the past to them is maybe a month ago <laughs> but I think that uh, as time passes more and more faculty will find the historical collections not only pertinent to medicine but important in understanding the broad scope of disease but we have a growing number of students who are really interested in the medical humanities. And using the history of medicine um, and our collection here is going to be, I think it's going to reach out to them and help them um, do a really fascinating projects. And we've got all the resources here for doing that. I would encourage pre-med students, especially, uh, to get involved and read these and do some papers on them and things like that. In my field, I'm interested in the manuscripts, and I think that when students take a look at manuscripts as opposed to books or incunabula, what they can learn about the art, the social history of the period is invaluable because they can see the wormholes, they can see the patches that were um, included in the vellum from the animals that were trapped to make it, they can find uh, evidence of water damage, they can see how difficult the text is to read, and they can tell the conjectures of the editors when they try to put those, those steps into print. Last year in my class, my students made their own medieval manuscripts. They used vellum and gold leaf and um, quills, and they modeled them on what they saw over here. So it was a wonderful resource. And what was their reaction to loved the resource? It. Absolutely loved it. They felt like experts. And actually, because they had seen the manuscripts and touched them and smelled them and put the pages, they sounded like experts. They were very proud of themselves. I was proud of them. I think there's a real risk of losing some of that connection with history. And we've seen it in a lot of areas uh, within medical research where people think that if it's not online, it doesn't exist at all. And it's critically important I think for the future of medical education, for the future of education in all fields, that people have a really strong and deep connection and commitment to the history of the professions that they're moving into. And this, I think, is one of the things that makes UAB Historical Collection so important, is the whole variety of outreach activities that we engage in so that we have multiple ways of bringing people in from their very undergraduate years all the way through their graduate education up into their years as practicing faculty, practicing clinicians, and really make that connection so that their history becomes alive. What do you think Dr. Reynolds would think about the library today and of the Historical Collections Union? I think he'd be delighted. I'd like to thank everybody who gave that time and that gifts, I think he would be delighted to know that it's here and how it's so beautiful and so many people are exposed to it and study from it.
and I'd like to thank all of them for him. If your eyes welled up with tears toward the end there, mine did too. Um, this would not have happened without the able assistance of Gabe Rios, our deputy director, and I just want to thank Gabe formally uh, for putting together such a fine uh, montage of reminiscences. I think one of the things that stands out as you look at this um, strolled out memory lane is for a half century, this institution has supported uh, both demonstrably uh, and in appreciable ways at all levels of university administration, from chairs to deans to provosts to presidents. Uh, it has consistently, uh, historical collections and the Reynolds Historical Library has consistently received um, steadfast support uh, for its programs and its endeavors. I'm very happy to say that that continues to this very day and we would not have been able to put this together and we would not be standing here before you without the continued and un un unflagging support of our current president. Please welcome President Carol Garrison. Well, thank you, Michael, and it's um, really good to be part of the continued support of the entire library, but particularly the Reynolds Collection. And good afternoon to all of you. Um, we're pleased that this weekend we've got a number of our medical alumni back um, visiting with us. Welcome to all of you. Our thanks to the community leaders who are in the audience. Um, we really appreciate your support for UAB and this lecture series. And of course, thanks to the Reynolds Associates because you're the ones that really make this possible. Now, as we just saw in the video, it has been half a century, and what an outstanding resource, um, indeed, um, the Reynolds Historical Library is for all of us. As we continue to push forward the frontiers of medicine, and boy, today we presented to the Board of Trustees some of the exciting research that we have going on at this institution, and we are pushing forward the frontiers, but you know, it's equally as important to preserve the past and to preserve the history. And that's really what this library and its holdings are about. Now, I'm particularly pleased that we are joined by Elizabeth Huey today. You saw her in the video. And Ms. Huey, thank you very much um, both for being in the video and sharing those reminiscences with us and for being here today. We, we indeed welcome you. Um, to Wayne Finley. Thank you. Um, it's your leadership that founded this wonderful lectureship series. And just as you have been a leader for this lectureship series, you and Sarah were true leaders and pioneers on this campus, so we are very appreciative. And Dr. McCallum, we are so glad that you are here today. Um, you have been a leader in so many ways. I always tell Scotty I have some really big footsteps to follow in um, as I follow after he and, and the other presidents and the various deans. Jim Pittman is here as, as well today. Um, names that we all recognize and um, understand their contributions. So enough of me. I know we look forward to hearing the remarks from our speaker today. And Scott Puchek, I believe you're here to introduce the speaker. Thanks very much, President Garrison. Um, I'm Scott Kluczak. I'm the director of the Lister Hill Library of the Health Sciences, and I would like to add my uh, welcome to you all and my thanks for being here. Um, this is the 29th annual historical lecture, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. 
Over the years, we have heard from and about many brilliant physicians and scientists who've done groundbreaking work in surgery, infectious diseases, immunology, public health, dentistry, nursing, and many other fields. These lectures have often been witty, frequently profound, usually entertaining, and occasionally impenetrable to some of us in the audience. <laughs> but even when we weren't quite sure that we were following the thread, we knew that we were witnessing something exciting and important. What the best of these lectures have done is to tell stories. Stories of the men and women who, because of their curiosity, their passion, their intelligence and training, were able to add to the fount of knowledge that has improved our lives and our world in so many ways. And one of the things that binds all of these stories together is libraries and books, the technologies and the artifacts that enable societies to capture and transmit and build on knowledge. For all of the native brilliance of the previous Reynolds lecturers and their many, many colleagues, none of it would have been possible were it not for the systems of books, publishing, and libraries that have been developed over the centuries. So it is extremely fitting that this year, on the 50th anniversary of the arrival of the Reynolds Library to UAB, we turn our attention from the disciplines of the health sciences to the world of libraries and books themselves. And I can think of few people more suited to guiding us than today's speaker. Dr. Steven Greenberg is currently the coordinator of public services for the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine. He received his doctorate in early modern history from Fordham University and his library degree from Columbia, where he specialized in rare books and special collections. He's published in a wide variety of fields, including the history of printing and publishing, medicine and surgery in early modern Europe, and the history of medical librarianship. Most recently, he's been working on a statistical comparison of the Index Medicus and the Index Catalog and doing some work and some investigations into the early use of photography in medical books. His chapter on curating history of medicine collections appears in the recently published textbook, Introduction to Health Sciences Librarianship. He is the recipient of the Medical Library Association's Murray Gottlieb Prize and continues his academic work as an adjunct professor at the College of Library and Information Studies at the University of Maryland, where he lectures on the history of the book. For those of us in the field of librarianship, this is an incredibly exciting time. With the advent of the Internet and the proliferation of information in digital formats, we are able to put more resources more quickly into the hands and minds of those who need them than we could have imagined possible just a couple of decades ago. And yet in our excitement over all of these wonderful new technologies, we must not lose sight of the importance of the powerful technologies that have preceded them and that they do not supplant or replace, but rather enhance, expand, and complement. Our speaker today is uniquely positioned to help us make those connections. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen J. Greenberg, the 2008 Reynolds Historical Lecturer. Thank you very much. Just a second here while we switch technologies. It's always a pleasure to come to a place like the Reynolds Library. You get to see old friends like Mike Flattery, Scott, you get to meet new people like Professor Garrison and all the other folks out here. Um, and it's also a lot of fun to be something of a trog. Um, I'm sorry. Are we better? Ooh. Yeah, we're better. OK. Um, I do a lot of presentations, both for the library in general and for the NIH Speakers Bureau. And I've become sort of interested in the sort of historical, bibliographical sociology of making presentations. And I've learned that, for example, that there are three rules. First of all, your title must have a colon. <laughs> Number two, there must be a PowerPoint. And if you're a librarian like me, you have to have a little trademark there because we worry about these things. And also, there must be an anecdote. Two are better. And the anecdotes must, on the surface, have nothing to do with the topic at hand. But in the end, you tie them together in a nice little package with a bow. So we will start today with a 1938 Bugatti Roadster. 
And the story goes something like this. Um, Krista Hamill, who probably knows more about illuminated manuscripts than anyone currently walking around today, tells the story of a fellow bookseller who, at the end of the Second World War, was trying to make a living selling books out of the trunk of his car driving around the north of England. Not a quality job plan. So he bought this old Italian sports car, loaded it up with early books, and drove around. And somewhere around Yorkshire or Northumberland or someplace really sort of desperate, he blew the head gasket. You can't find Bugatti head gaskets in northern England in the late 40s, early 50s. But he did have in the trunk of his car some sheets of 14th century vellum, which were blank, we hope. And he cut a head gasket out of the vellum, put it in place, and the car ran apparently quite well. So well that for years later, people would turn to him and say, that's a great car, how old is it? And he said, parts of it go back to the 14th century. <laughs> now that is a real book moment. You could not have done that with a digital book. Two anecdotes, I promised. This one comes from my own personal history. Um, when I was at Columbia going to library school, and for those of you who know something of the history of the Columbia University School of Library Service, originally the School of Library Economy when Melville Dewey first founded it, um, I was the next to last class to get out of Columbia before they shut it down. That was the famous Take No Incompletes class. I did an internship at the New York Public Library in their Rare Books and Special Collections unit. And one day a young man, and I mean a very young man, he was about 13, showed up with his mother. He wanted to look at a 16th century canon law book in the library's collections. And since the library did not put 16th century books in front of 13-year-old kids, he brought his mom. And they came up there, and the kids, he's, I remember he had an Oakland Athletics baseball cap, and he turned the cap around so the brim would not hit the book. And he's looking at the book, and New York Public did the whole thing. They put out a cradle of foam rests, and they covered it with velvet and opened the book, and the kid looks down at the book and goes, what language is that? We said, it's Latin, which is, you know, not an unexpected language for a 16th century canon law book. And the kid says, I can't read this. His mother momentarily vacillated between deciding whether she should kill the kid right then and there, or whether they should try to melt into the terrazzo floor. Uh, so they left rather more noisily than people normally leave that reading room. And the librarians, for the rest, they were complaining like, oh, they should have picked up on this. You know, there was an, an interview, an entrance interview before you got to the collection. And there was a very good catalog record. And all the tracings were there. It was all in Latin. So anyone who had been paying attention might have said to the kid, by the way, do you read any Latin? But I thought about it, because first of all, I was an intern. I wasn't getting paid, so what did I care how I spent my day? I said, you know, perhaps this young man would be inspired to learn Latin, because now he knew that there were such things out there. I'm sure his mother would rather he became a stockbroker or something. Um, but again, this is a real book moment. You know, this is a young man who was interested enough to talk his way into the reading room and have the book put in front of him. And if you couldn't read it, well, there are lots of books in our collections that we can't read. But they're there. And someone will read them. Now, it's great being here at the Reynolds Library. And I want to thank you know, Mike and Scott, Professor Garrison, everyone. Um, so we have to have a moment just remembering what a wonderful collection the Garrison, rather, the Reynolds Library does. I have to say, Dr. Garrison, I keep thinking of Fielding Garrison. OK, um, and for those of us who know the history of medicine, that's a great name to have if you're in the history of medicine. And all these, you know, we have little digital snippets here, but each one of these books has a history, has a personality, has a feel, possibly even an aroma that is different, because these are real books. And as much fun as it is to play with them in their digital form, these are real books. I did a lot of my research on the history of printing and publishing in early modern England. And this, and by the way, do not try to read this. You cannot from that distance. 
But this is a plague bill, and it's one of the first printed public health documents in the history of Western medicine. It's from 1603, and it's listing by parish who's dying and who's dying of plague in a particular week in London in 1603. And if you know anything about history of England in the early 17th century, this is not the sort of information you would expect to have readily available. And yet great steps were taken to make sure this information was out there. This is still an era when if you had a letter from a friend or relative in France and they mailed it to you in London, if you got the letter, and you published the letter, you could have fingers and ears and things cut off. They're very big on cutting off pieces of ear. Um, but what I find fascinating about this, and these are extremely rare nowadays. I know of only two sets. One of them is at Harvard. The other is the British Library. Edelin has none of these. But you also find out that if you look at the one from Harvard, and if you look at the one from the British Library, they're not the same. This is a little easier to see. Um, but you'll notice, by the way, here you have buried in all, buried of the plague, and these are the parish names. By the way, the reason why it was collected by parish is very simple. If someone died, you had to open a grave, and if you had to open a grave, you needed to speak to the parish clerk. So that's your choke point, okay? Of course, if you are Catholic or Jewish or something, you know, bizarre like that, you wouldn't be recorded. So this would be how many good Anglicans are dying of plague. But if you look at the top one, you'll notice these decorations are different. So is this one over here. This is the crest of the city of London. And you realize that, in fact, two presses are being used. Now, that may seem to be a small thing, but you can, in fact, work out if more than one press was being used, you have an idea of how many of these were being printed. And it works kind of like this. The printers got the numbers on Thursday. They were expected to collect them, gather them, collate them, and have the bills in the hand of the town council, the London County Council, by the following Monday. We know that the press work would require that you could do about 1,700 of these a day. We also know that they left the type standing from week to week and they just changed the numbers. And for a printer to tie up his type, both literally and figuratively, there had to be a reason. So they've only got really one day to print. They didn't print on Saturdays and they didn't print on Sundays. They've got one day to print. So if you're using two presses, the implication is you're making somewhere more than 1,700, probably around 3,000. So even though they are extremely rare today, they're printing 3,000 of them a week for weeks and weeks on end. So by being able to compare the physical item, you have a sense of the print run. And by the way, the economics of this was really very simple as well. The Crown, the London Council, did not pay to have this done. They simply gave the monopoly to a single printer. And he got to sell them for a penny, and he got the money. That's how you ran government in Tudor Stewart, England. Get someone else to do it for free and give them the monopoly. Let's get digital. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the National Library of Medicine's Turning the Pages project. Um, this is a project where we have taken digital books which we've taken from books from our collection or the collections of libraries we've worked with and put them up in a selective digital format. There are two formats at the moment. What you're looking at here is our Turning the Pages kiosk. There are two of these at the library, but they're also available on the World Wide Web. And what you can actually do is you get to see the book and literally turn the pages. The technology is kind of fun. You take a high resolution digital photograph you then animate it by putting it into a program that places this page on what's called a wireframe. And then as the page turns, you have different illustrations because the wireframe gets the movement of the page correctly. 
And for those of you who are more high-tech than others, it takes 18 TIFFs to turn a single page. That's a lot of TIFF. I don't do that part of it. This is our Vesalius. It's the first book that we did, and it was done in conjunction with the British Library, who, in fact, came up with the technology first, worked with us, and then we sort of went our separate ways because the British Library serves a different population. Also, they can sell things, which we can't do. After we did the Vesalius and we did um, a very lovely 17th century herbal, 18th century herbal, excuse me, um, Dr. Lindbergh, our director, said, can we do something that's a little bit more medical, please? So we decided to do Ambrose Paré's complete works. This is the 1585 fourth edition, um, a milestone in the history of surgery. You know, it's funny, you know, and librarians get involved in this and collectors, you know, do you want the first edition? Do you want the best edition? Do you want the edition that's in the best you know, condition to do this with. Um, I actually got to choose this one. Okay, I'm not normally that important. But I picked the 1585 fourth edition because all of the stories you've ever heard about Paré, you know, the stuff about um, he was on a battlefield in Turin, you know, and he's trying to cauterize wounds, right? We're talking hot oil and all this stuff. You know, and this is an age of edged weapons, so it's like, stop the bleeding fast or you've got yourself a dead patient. And he ran out of boiling oil. So he stitched up the wounds instead. And he said, well, I treated him, but God cured him. That story appears in the 1585 fourth edition. Because Perret had caught a lot of flack because, you see, he wasn't a doctor. He was a barber surgeon. And there was much social whatevering. Should the book be in French? Should it be in Latin? Perret spoke no Latin. So there's a lot going on here under the hood. So for the fourth edition, he included this beautiful apologia. And all the stuff that you know about Perret, all the great anecdotes are there. So we picked this edition. And we had fun. And what you're seeing here are actually screenshots of the web version. Um, you have the page, and here you have the famous portrait of Paré and some pictures of sharp and nasty looking things on the, the recto page there. And you can make explanatory information pop up, even if it's from another book. The inset is from Guy de Choliac. That manuscript, again in our collection, is about 300 years older than the Paré. But you can see that the patterns of the surgical tools are really not all that different. In fact, I always had this lovely vision of someone taking the Choliac manuscript down to the blacksmith and saying, make me one that looks like this. You know? Since this is, as I said, an age of edged weapons, you have on the verso page nice sharp things for cutting bone. And on the recto, you have prosthetic noses, you can see which one I bought. <laughs> and now if we're lucky, and I think we will be because the tech folks here have been very helpful. There we go. We're now on the web. And let's go to our newest web version. This is Robert Hooke's Micrographia from 1665. Now, when you're on the kiosk, we actually have touch screens. So you brush your hand across the page, and it turns. In fact, there's even sound effects, which was really very tricky. Because of the two kiosks, one is in a room approximately the size of this. The other is in, I hate to say it, a converted coat closet. So the sound of the pages riffling gently in the big room is deafening. <laughs> in the smaller room, so. And it opens. And you have foldouts, who also fold back. There is an explanatory text. And I, Mike, could you turn the speakers back on for just a minute? 
and we have audio. Hook's formal education included the Westminster School and Christ Church, Oxford, but it might be more useful to regard him as largely self-educated, for his greatest talent was as an inveterate tinkerer, the kind that takes things apart to see just how they work. And attempts to reassemble them with more art than science. And we have See the little hand that kind of floats in and out there wherever you have that, you've collected another bit of data from an outside source. And last but not least, we have my favorite little thing here, which is called Zoomify, where you can actually zoom up and down. Now the fun thing about this, and again, those of you who are familiar with how NLM works these days, there is no special programming involved here. This is all off-the-shelf software because we're not allowed to develop our own software anymore. Thank you, Al Gore. So this is a whole bunch of commercially available applications put together with a lot of artistry. The people in our, and I'd love to be able to say it, the people in our Lister Hill Center who do the R&D work um, do some lovely things here. Close this up Oh, actually, I should go back a page. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this picture. It's one of the most famous in the book. Um, Hook was looking at um, some sections of cork bark through his microscopes. And he was looking at the plant cells over here, the square ones, and said, wow, you know, it looks just like the cells that monks live in in a monastery. And that kind of stuck. So this is the picture. Now, the thing about this, though, is that we're looking not at the actual book, but we're looking at some sort of representation of the book. This is what the raw shot looks like. And, of course, um, for you photographers out there, you've got your grayscales and your color scales to get things right. Um, our tech people, the first time they did a page like this, they said, well, it looks all scuzzy and dirty. Let's clean it up. So I got this thing that looked like a photocopy. I said, no, I want the dirt back, please. And of course, there's a, a real temptation, especially when you've got a wealth of materials, to play. So here you have a picture showing Hook's original design for microscope. And my buddies over at the National Museum of Health and Medicine over at Walter Reed happened to own Hooks or one of Hooks' original microscopes, and they were talked into getting us some pictures of that, which is sort of nice. And then you have what you might call unexpected consequences. There was more stuff than we could put into the digital version because the digital version really can only run about 40 pages. After that, it just gets too big for anybody to easily play with. So we have sort of an overlap into what became known as Hook's Books, which was the material that we couldn't fit in, and it became an exhibit in the library's lobby. And you can see the microscope you know, loaned from our folks in the Army. And there will be a Hook's Books website coming up soon, as soon as I finish doing it. That's called a timetable. But again, what are you looking at? Here's an opening. We're back in Paray now. And if you have your French with you, and if I can get, oh, this, this won't zoom. Um, you'll notice that over here, it says that we're in the 11th book, and over here we're in the 15th book. This is not the opening as it appears in the original book. These are just two pages that we put together when we were selecting. We have 40 illustrations. The book is 1,400 pages. So we have to be kind of selective. Um, there were page numbers. And we were talking nice 16th century French Roman numbers that kind of go on forever. And they were photoshopped out. Um, for those of you who are you know, the book types, you'll notice that we left the catchwords in. And of course, technically, this word down here should be the first word up there, but it's not. 
that's how printers and bookbinders made sure they were doing things correctly when they were folding the books. Obviously, that has not survived the change. So the question is, once again, what are you looking at? Here's the famous <laughs> opening from Henry V. You know, oh, for a muse of fire. And I've got my own personal Agincourt here. But is this the first folio? Or is it a facsimile of the first folio? Now, many of you are familiar with Charlton Hinman, but I will talk some more about him in case there are folks here who are not. Um, Charlton Hinman was a bibliographer who during World War II worked for Army Air Force Intelligence analyzing aerial photographs. And he worked out a little device where you would take two photographs taken of the same subject on two consecutive days. You would be seeing one with your right eye, one with your left eye. And there would be a little device with mirrors or prisms that would flip back and forth. The headache possibilities here are just dramatic. Anything that was unchanged would appear solid. Anything that had moved, maybe a tank underneath camouflage netting, would flutter. After the war, Heyman was hired by the Folger Shakespeare Library, built a device using that technology to compare copies of books. It's called a Hinman Collator. And he then compared the 70 copies of the Shakespeare First Folio in the Folger Collection and published a wonderful two-volume work on the printing and publishing of the First Folio using information gotten by comparing all these pages. But the other thing that came out of this project is this book that you're looking at now, which is the um, Norton facsimile, the first folio. And it is, in a very real sense, an imaginary book. Because what they did was to select the best exemplar of every individual page and include it in this facsimile, and then put those nice big fat margins around it so nobody would think it was the original book. The color and texture of the paper notwithstanding, of course. There are some silly people out there. So this is an imaginary book, because no book was actually printed with this selection of pages. It's the best of every one of them. The Folger has moved on. Now they have up a first folio in PDF format. And I love PDF. You know, Everybody's got a PDF reader, and if you don't, you download one. It takes two seconds, and you get to play. And this, of course, does not represent a selection of pages. This is a single copy of the book now. And by the way, if you want your very own digital copy of the first folio, just you know, scare up about, oh, I think it's about 150 megabytes of space. Not really a whole lot, and you can download it off the Folger website. What you do with it, that's something else. This was done by a company called Octavo. And what they, Octavo did was to put in all sorts of additional features so that you could manipulate the text, search it, and things of that sort. The trouble is that Octavo went out of business, and now the sites don't work anymore. So the text is there, but all the value-added features have sort of gone away. So all these cute little download the files and, you know, the, the extra stuff, the links are dead. I should also mention that the, the Folger, um, in conjunction with the Library of Congress and a little bit of help from my place, um, has put together what they call page by page, which is a turning the pages version of Romeo and Juliet. At the moment, it's only available um, in the Folger Shakespeare Library, which is a good reason to go, because it's a lovely place. But they have Romeo and Juliet and you can page through it, and there's all sorts of things that pop up and give you additional information about Romeo and Juliet. And of course, that's perfect, because remember I said earlier that 40 pages is about the max size you can go on this? Guess how long the first folio version of Romeo and Juliet is? 40 pages. So, Plus they put in some front matter as well, so it's very nice. Now the National Library of Medicine, among other things, is responsible for making texts available to people who need them. 
and our National Center for Biomedical Informatics, NCBI, has done all sorts of cute little high-tech things on this. We have the NCBI bookshelf, which is free access to selected medical texts. There are modern texts, like Cancer Medicine, 6th edition, up full text for free. Or we have historical texts, and these are selected by my division. We have them up either as HTML, or we have them up in PDF. This is a rather nice one, actually. Um, I couldn't show enough pages in this, but this is actually an autographed copy by Clara Barton presented to the Surgeon General's Library, which is the predecessor library to NLM. So this is kind of nice. We have an ongoing project called Cholera Online, which, if you don't know what it is, sounds kind of scary. Um, but it's, in fact, it's a selection of text put up in PDF format about the history of cholera. And again, these are HTML or PDF. They are all public domain, which means that you can download them and give them out to your students and play, do anything you want with them. The idea is availability. But there's a problem. The disc on the left is my doctoral dissertation. You'll notice it says disc number one. I had another name for it, but I wouldn't put that on a label. Um, and on the right, we have Multimate. Now, I don't know how many of you remember Multimate. Multimate was kind of big for a while. Uh, for those of you who really go back in your tech, it was derived from the software that Wang used. Remember Wang? and dedicated word processors. There was a concept that sort of went away. Even if I had a computer that would accept the five inch disk, this isn't gonna run on Windows Vista, folks. This is DOS 3.2, that's as far as you go. So this is essentially now jewelry. You know, it can make cute little earrings out of it. <laughs> Um, by the way, this actually was done about a year after my dissertation was finished, and a buddy of mine, who types a lot faster than I ever will, typed this up for me. And she, after doing that, we actually converted it to three-inch disks and put it in Word, uh, so it's a little better. But you're looking here at an artifact. Now, at the same time that this was being done, I had these made. In, in ye old days, um, my university, Fordham at that point, um, required that anyone who did a doctoral dissertation had to have it microfilmed by University Microfilms International, now ProQuest. And they made microfilm copies. And, and you could order a microfiche or microfilm copy of your own for pennies while they were producing it. And it struck me as being very amusing for about a week to walk around with a copy of my dissertation in my shirt pocket. But... I present this to you as the preservation copy of my dissertation. This is readable. The discs are not. If all the microfilm and microfiche readers in the world disappeared tomorrow, after the applause died down, um, I think it was Barbara Tuckman who said the only thing worse than microfilm is not having microfilm. Okay? <laughs> This is at least readable with a candle and a you know, magnifying glass if you were so, yeah. I hear the laughter out there. If you have any aspirin left over from using the Hinman collator, you save it for reading microfiche. But this is readable. And the other stuff is not. So you end up with what you might call the access technology as opposed to the preservation technology. When NLM puts a book up on the web, whether it is a modern text in cancer surgery or Clara Barton talking about the Red Cross, we do not see that as being our preservation copy. The original book is preserved. We do this to give access, not to preserve. But sometimes the access is a lot of fun. 
our newest project is the Smith Surgical Papyrus. It's the oldest medical book in the United States. It is approximately 1600 BC. It belongs to my good buddies at the New York Academy of Medicine. And this is why this PowerPoint is so big. Yes, I want to open it. Vista does not trust you, you know. It, What you do is that you can pull this open. It doesn't like touch pads a whole lot. I have greasy fingers. And you can magnify it with a little zoomify again. And we pull some more of this out. Incidentally, I'm not on the web now. This is simply loaded on my computer. We will be putting this up on our website um, sometime this spring. Here you have an explanatory text written by a colleague of mine explaining what the cases are. And then you have an actual brand new translation and showing where it exists on the actual text. Now, there are a whole lot of stories about this, but the one I have to um, point out, which is especially fun, is that the Metropolitan Museum of Art has been trying to borrow the Smith Papyrus forever, and the Academy didn't want to do it. And finally, they got talked into it uh, about a year and a half ago. And for those of you who have a New York geography sense, you know how close those two you know, institutions are geographically. I mean, they're like less than 20 blocks apart. You can just take the 50 Avenue bus, boom, and you're there. Uh, though that's not what they actually did. But when the um, papyrus was taken out of its protective enclosures and being prepared for the exhibit, somebody said, let's take some TIFFs, folks. And then NLM said, can we borrow the TIFFs? And so we did this. The manuscript did not go down to Bethesda just the TIFFs. And the other fun thing about this, and you can see this more clearly, whoops, just lost it. Sorry about that. You'll notice that some of the papyrus looks a little cleaner than others. That's because somebody about 100 years ago, and I've always, you know, the Academy people who are my good friends, make me promise that I'm going to say this every time. Someone cut this thing apart into 25 individual sheets of papyrus. And we, it was to make it easier to store. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so digitally, it's been put back together. So in fact, all this stuff in the middle here is Photoshop. Nicely done, though, isn't it? And it keeps on going. You'll notice as I do this that the scroll gets smaller down here as you're rolling it out. Because the Smith has a little secret. And if you can just bear with me as I scroll through this. See, there's stuff on the back. So when you get to the end, almost there. See the writing on the back? Reminds me of my bar mitzvah when I was unrolling the Torah. Now you're at the end now, and it turns around. Come on. Wow. 
And it's cute because you see, it's real hardcore surgery on the front, and it's magic on the back. It's like spells and potions and things. And then, of course, we have the greatest effect of them all, the rewind. Your tax dollars at work, folks. <laughs> Coming up on Turning the Pages, we have an alchemy textbook. Alchemy is very big right now. Think Harry Potter. We do a lot of business in alchemy. Um, we want to do William Smelly on obstetrics, which has got some very striking pictures. Um, though they're very dark field, they may be difficult to reproduce. And we've also been talking about what I'm calling synthetic books. And let me explain what I mean. Um, many of you know that, that we're coming up on the Charles Darwin centennial. We're actually, I, no, centennial, right. OK, or, or whatever it is. Um, the trouble is that Darwin's books are not illustrated, so they're not really good topics for turning the pages. So no problem, we'll just drag in things from other books. So you have your Darwin text in front of you, and then we'll just pop things in and out. So you can have an imaginary book there. So I said at the beginning of my talk that there were three unbreakable rules for doing a presentation, but of course I lied, there's a fourth. Gotta have bullet points. So here are our bullet points. Technology will not guarantee preservation. After all, who can guarantee we'll have PDF readers in 50 years or 100 years? or 500 years from now. Technology will not guarantee access. Technology will only get you so far, but without technology, you're not going anywhere. So what we've put up are real books, and there's a time and a place for real books. There's a time and a place for digital books. Many more people will see the Smith Papyrus now. Many more people will see a selection of illustrations from whatever books we choose to do. But it does not replace the original book. When someone comes to my library and says, I'm interested in doing research on Paré, I do not take them first to turning the pages. I give them the book. And I intend to keep on giving them the book. So. What we have to do is remember what we can accomplish. We can make a lot of spiffy things and improve access. But nothing that we have done so far and nothing that we are likely to do in the foreseeable future is going to replace the original book. And that is why, and this is why NLM has not done more digitizing, because people want us to do digitization as preservation. And it's just not stable. The technology moves too quickly. If one day someone comes up with the permanent digital format guarantee for the next millennium, then I can see Dr. Lindbergh, our director, going down to the Congress and saying, OK, guys, it's time. Last week, um, Mark Timunation, who's the head of rare books and specials at the Library of Congress, came to NLM and gave a little talk. And Mark is a very charming guy. Um, he also knows his stuff inside and out. And he's trying to put together the original Jefferson Library. Now, many of you know the story, but for those of you who don't, you know, in 1814, the British got to DC and they burned the place down pretty thoroughly. And the couple of bookshelves of books the Library of Congress had then got burned. So Thomas Jefferson sold his library to the federal government. And of course, they bitched about the price. So things don't change. Um, but some years later, the Library of Congress had another fire, and many of those books were destroyed. So what Mark is trying to do is to recreate Jefferson's original library. And he's not talking about digital copies. He's talking about books. Now, when it's done, and we're talking, I think it's about 6,500 volumes. Um, when it's done, there will be a digital library made up. But I do not think that anybody at the Library of Congress, and certainly no one that I know, 
is saying, well, once we have those, you know, that 6,500 books, we can sell them on eBay or something and just keep the digital copies. So thank you for listening. And do visit NLM either virtually or if you happen to be in D.C., come on by. Yes, you really can still get into the National Library of Medicine, or you will make some new friends on the way in. I will be happy to. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Talk a little bit about uh, how labor intensive this is, uh, a turning book project, for example. Um, a lot less than you might think. Um, first of all, some poor librarian, historian type person like me um, has to select the appropriate book and narrow down what are the pages that we want to do the 40 pages. Um, then we have them digitally photographed. That's done by a contractor. And then we turn them over to our Lister Hill people who, and there's one poor guy, his name is Mike Chung, who does 99% of the work. And Mike takes the stuff and puts it on the wireframe. And, you know, the devil's in the details, okay? Um, the page will turn differently if it's at the beginning of the book than it will at the end of the book. And also, a page turns differently if you turn it from the top, the middle, and the bottom. So in fact, there were three access points on the touch screen to make sure it's turning right. Because they didn't want you to brush your page against the bottom and then have it turned from the top. So there are three points. Um, it takes about three, four months, depending on what other stuff they give Mike to do. <laughs> because you know, not, no one ever, is there anyone in this room that ever works on one project at a time and nothing else? So, yeah, um, it's, there's worse, there's worse. And, of course, the scholarship of, um, involved in it, you have to make sure you're describing correctly. In that sense, the Smith papyrus was a snap -a doodle because the Museum of Art arranged to have the TIFFs made. Yale University Press combined with the Met to get a new translation done, and they simply loaned us the translation. So that was just cutting and pasting. Um, it really helps to have a computer guy that can make this stuff sing. I mean, yeah. But other than that, it's not so bad. Sir? A number of years ago, I think I heard on NPR a story where one of the libraries wanted to get their entire collection digitized, and they were talking about some of the copyright issues and stuff. But I had the impression that they were talking about books in their entirety. And you're talking about being limited to 40 pages. So I guess the question is, how are the technologies different? OK. There's a big difference between putting something up in a PDF format. You can put a 500-page book up in PDF. It's not so bad. Um, the Shakespeare First Folio, I think, is about 675 pages. Anyone who's a Shakespeare scholar out there, throw something at me if I'm wrong. Um, in PDF, it's easy. In turning the pages, you have so many images going by to make the page turn right. So turning the pages is really designed to be pretty. It's not a scholarly tool. The third graders love it, and teachers love it. You know, I, I get to do a lot of booths, you know, at American Historical Association, things like that. The teachers just love it because they can, in their classroom, give their fourth graders a look at a, at a book. Um, that and our Turning the Pages program, or rather, our, I'm sorry, Profiles in Science, which is a digital manuscripts program, okay? We have all these digital things, and they're PDF and public domain. And, um, you know, we just put up hundreds and hundreds of pages, thousands of pages. Um, Nobel Prize winners, uh, Dr. Koop's papers are up on... Um, you know, on, on profiles in science, and these things are just downloadable, and the teachers just love it because they can make their kids look at primary sources whether they want to or not. But 99% of the space taken up by a returning the pages thing is the animation. And if you just want to read it, you know, you don't need the animation. Um, Google Books did approach the National Library of Medicine 
about becoming part of the Google Books project, and we said, um, no, um, work out your copyright thing first. Um, you know, Google and YouTube's approach to copyright is we'll put it up until someone takes us, tells us to take it down. Okay, and like, we can't work that way. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't. You know, we have to be proactive, not reactive. Um, some of you may remember when, uh, like, I think it was Viacom was suing Google in Europe about all the Viacom things, and Viacom said, you know, you got our stuff up, and it's copyright, and Google said, okay, we'll take it down. And they did. Okay, that's what I guess I would call reactive copyright protection. And like, uh-uh. Now, of course, we're not in the same boat as the Library of Congress, because, you know, the Library of Congress is copyright. <laughs> You know, um, and we are not connected to the federal government in the same way the National or the Library of Congress is, and we do not have, thank God, their responsibility to enforce copyright. But um, we're not going to mess with that. Sir, I know this is about your history business, not the periodical business, but periodicals are part of history too. And uh, I was curious about what the percentage of the NLM uh, budget is uh, periodically, the uh, periodicals uh, versus uh, history. Are you talking about preserving what we've got or buying new? No, uh, both. All, anything you spend money on and uh, it comes out in the, what do you, what, what do you call the, the, uh, the monthly, uh, period, monthly, books that uh, are published, or used to be published. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, I, I don't know the NLM budget, okay? I'm not that important. No matter what Scott thinks, I'm, I'm really not. Um, but it used to be something like 80% of our acquisitions budget was for periodicals and serials as opposed to monographic literature. Um, now, that has changed in weird ways because of online periodicals. Um, at the moment, it's my understanding that any periodical that is available both in an electronic format and a paper format, we buy both. Because the paper is our copy of record for reasons that I've gone into ad nauseum. Okay. Um, I remember about 10, 12 years ago, I was on a committee to investigate off-site storage for the National Library of Medicine. And we were going to um, chip in on some space that was put together by the Washington Research Libraries Consortium, or what I call the George Schools. George Mason, George Washington, George Town, okay? They had built this high-techy thing. You know, and again, for you librarians, this is your high-density stacks where books are put in in size place so you can cram more of them in and you um, you can get to them digitally because you know where they are. It doesn't matter that the two of them are not next to each other on the shelf where the call number should be because everything's got a barcode so you know where it is and that way you, know, you cram everything together tightly. And we decided not to do it because we said, oh, who's going to need the space in five years? We'll be getting just electronic journals. Well, oops on that one. Um, we are out of space at the National Library of Medicine. Big surprise. Um, we were given money to plan for an extension. We have pretty models and things of it. We don't have the money to build it, but we have the blueprints. Um, we have very limited off-site storage. Most of our stuff is actually on site, and it's getting pretty tight down there. Um, we do rent some space from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And we have basically like manuscript collections that are unaccessioned. Okay. Librarians think that accession is a verb, which is always kind of amusing. Um, but that's our off-site stuff. But we continue, and we will continue, to provide both digital access and hard copy record keeping. Um, PubMed, you know, which is the, the latest incarnation of the Medline Index Medicus back forever kind of stuff. Um, PubMed increasingly allows us to link to full text of the journal. And of course, the stumbling block there in what we can link to and what we can't link to is not our technology or our willingness or even our time. 
It's the publisher. Publishers live in that world of capitalism where you don't give away what you can sell. Okay? Um, and it's our job, and we've been pretty successful in this one, in saying, you know, if you take the advertisements that were in your paper quarterly journal and you put them on your website, make your website free, and then have it linked into PubMed, so you do your PubMed search, you push a button, and you go to the publisher's website and see the text, more people will see your ads, and therefore you can charge more for your ads, right? Because that's how this, you know, how this business works. It's the advertisements that you know, finance things. And that is kind of the way of the future, but there's a lot of very specialized journals. You know, I mean, you, you, you know the ones I'm talking about, the ones that have a subscription base of 12. <laughs> and so they sell them to libraries, and the libraries pay, you know, $14,000 a year to subscribe to a quarterly journal. <coughs> yeah. Yes? We, we uh, used to have a journal here called the Alabama Journal of Medical Sciences. It started around 1960. Uh, and it went for some years and uh, went to several editors. Then we got an editor who was a drunk most of the time. And, uh, and it was published. The papers in it were usually uh, locally generated. And uh, it didn't have any status in the world. And so we discontinued it. Later on, People talked about maybe we ought, we ought to have a local publication like that. And uh, I went to you or, or Cassidy or somebody up there and uh, uh, found uh, the old journals, which were there, are still there. And uh, they were in, uh, I guess, PubMed or maybe, maybe Index Medicus. Uh, Carmichael, who was an editor, a niche editor, uh, was very proud that he got it into the index medicals, which apparently not everybody got into. That's correct. And um, and it was still there, of course, a few years ago. Now I suppose it's still there. There's been some talk lately about trying to restart that thing. I don't know where where we get minor anymore, but or who would publish it? That's a big problem because it doesn't have the status in the world. But uh, what would happen if we wanted to do that? Could we? Could we resume the thing and get started back with the original? Uh... Well, there are two questions here. Um, I can answer one of them with, with great certainty. If you did start it, we would want it in our collection. Absolutely. Now, um, let me take a second and bore you about Index Medicus and PubMed and what we get and what we um, index. In 1880, we began to publish this thing called the Index Catalog of the Library Surgeon General's Office, U.S. Army, sometimes known as the Index Catalog or the Surgeon General's Catalog or whatever. And this was a, um, a catalog of all of the library's important, magic word, important holdings. And John Shaw Billings, our director at the time, said, you know, it'll probably take us about 15 years to go through everything we've got, all the monographs, all the journal titles, and selected important articles in this 15-volume thing that he envisioned. It actually took 15 years, 1880, 1895, and uh, Billings celebrated the completion of the first series of the Index Catalog by retiring and becoming the first director of the New York Public Library. But since this was an alphabetical series, his associate, Robert Fletcher, said, Dr. Billings, Dr. Billings, how are we going to keep up? You know, if an article comes out on aardvarks the year after we've done the A volume, it's going to be a decade before we can put it in an index. And Billings said, that's okay, Bob. What we'll do is we'll take a selection of the journals that we trust, and we'll just do a quarterly, later annual index of selected articles, I'm sorry, excuse me, that's wrong, selected journals, the journals that we trust, but every article in them. And that, of course, becomes the Index Medicus. And it is very, very hard to get your journal in the Index Medicus. There is, to this day, a committee 
called LISTRIC, the Literature Selection and Technical Review Committee. And they meet three times a year to make sure that we're doing the right journals. And I believe, is Lucretia McClure still chair of LISTRIC, or is she just finished doing that? I think she's still chair. OK. Um, this is a tough committee. You don't mess. And journal, you know, journal publishers would come with their local pet congressmen because getting yourself included in Index Medicus is a big deal. So at some point, your journal was considered to be a big deal. But just because we don't index it doesn't mean we don't get it. At any given moment, there's something between 4,500 and 5,500 journals that we're indexing. We're subscribing to over 20,000. So please do not you know, confuse indexing with subscribing. If you restart it, we'll subscribe. Put me down. Would, would it be in the index? Would it be in PubMed? Um, you'd have to go to the, to the district committee and convince them it was worth doing. Would it be in the collection? Would it be findable in the collection? Yes, it would. Well, we'll be able to continue this with a reception that is following immediately in the museum adjoining the Ireland Room, the Alabama Museum of the Health Sciences. We want to invite you uh, to the reception where you'll be able to uh, chat with uh, Dr. Greenberg and ask him more questions. But for now, thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Thank you, Dr. And thank you all.